Hi everyone, I am Ray Gaucher and welcome to this edition of Bible Break. Um, you are probably watching this on Truth and Testimony, the broadcast, as well as Life on the Road with Yeshua and Trucker Ray. Pleasure to have you viewing. I am starting a mini-series. It's only two videos. I've uh, been wanting to do this one for a while. The story of Noah's Ark. And I know there's controversy, and I know some people think, well, this never happened, it's impossible. Uh, but it did happen, and there's proof of it. Um, there are findings of Noah's Ark um, uh, in the mountains near Mount Ararat. And I do believe it's, I think it's in Turkey. Uh, regardless, nevertheless, whether you believe it or not, the Bible is the living Word of God, and it is truth, and it is true. And uh, I'll tell you right now, the, the truth in itself right there is the rainbow. When God um, said that he would put a sign that he would never flood the earth again. And that's where we see the rainbow. That's what it stands for. It does not represent a group of people. It represents the promise of God that he would never flood the earth again. So, uh, because... To get the full story, it's roughly three chapters, 84 verses. Um, going to split them in two, so we're going to do 42 verses this time, 42 verses next time. And um, it's actually a very interesting story. The, the, the biggest part about the story that I love is how obedient Noah is. Here's God telling him to do something that looks almost impossible to do on dry land. And the ridicule he must have met um, and got uh, is probably ridiculous. So, before we get into this, why don't we open up with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity again to read your word. Lord, I just pray that you help me read this properly and to decipher it properly and to convey it properly. And would you bless everyone that's listening and watching right now. And please, Lord, would you bless me and give me a special anointing that I could read this um, almost with some kind of power that it would just bless everyone that's watching it right now. And I would also like to dedicate this series to my dear friend, Mary Dwyer. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, friends, I am reading out of the Restoration Study Bible, King James Translation. Uh, those of you that are not familiar with this translation, it is the Restoration Study Bible 4th edition. A wonderful translation. I, uh, I love to read, it out of, read out of this. There's a lot of people that, like my friend Adrian Scott, he likes to use lots of different translations. I mean, he'll use... Um, certain translations to do some studying and, and, and that's awesome and I know some other teachers that do that um, I stick to one because it's hard enough as it is to master this translation because it's still King James and it uses a lot of Hebrew words in it so if you're ready let's get going we got 42 verses to go here and this is going to be exciting now please bear with me because it's a little difficult sometimes to read the King James translation in the Old Testament. I find it easier in the New Testament. So if I make a little blunder, I will go back and correct myself. I'm just a man, I'm human, and I make mistakes just like everybody else. But I'll try to also describe it as much as possible so you understand. All right? So let's start. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for, he, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and 20 years. Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of Elohim came, in, came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children with them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, at the beginning here where it says, Ah... Uh, 
and the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men. These are the giants. And you're probably wondering, well, who are these giants? These giants are fallen angels. Now, in the book of Revelation, it mentions, probably in other places in Scripture, it mentions that Satan was cast out of heaven and he took a third of the angels with him, which became demonic angels, uh, rebellious angels. Now, it mentions it in Revelation. I know it probably mentions it in other um, parts of the Bible. And some might say, well, no, Revelation is a future thing. It hasn't happened yet. Well, it doesn't really say that when you're looking at the book of Revelation. When it says a third of the angels, well, he was cast out of heaven. It says Satan fell like lightning and he was cast out. So it could have been at this time. I don't know. Let's just think about that that is possible. Or there could have been other angels, demonic angels, that decided to be disobedient to God. I just think it's the same event. But I could be wrong. Check for yourself. It could. I could be wrong. So, and other pagan material that you will see, um, they mention these, these fallen angels, these sons of men. They were called, uh, I think it's pronunciated Nephilim. Nephilim or Nephilim. Um, they, pagan books, uh, non religious books, consider these men heroes. They figured that they were on the earth to enrich those that were on the earth, when in fact, uh, <clears throat> I think they just flat out did this to, re to rebel against God and spread evil along throughout the earth, which you will see as we continue is exactly what they did. So, these giants, these sons of men that we're going to be hearing about, these are clearly fallen angels. So we're going to pick it up at verse 4 again. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of Elohim came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So these fallen angels took the form of men, and, um, yeah, they had children. They had children with, uh, with and, and spread their evil throughout the earth. Verse 5, And Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you imagine that? I would say it's very similar to now. Think about it. How many positive things do you hear out there on the news? The governments out there, the, the rhetoric, the evil, the anti-Semitism. It's insane. Verse 6. And it repented Yahweh that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So here's Yahweh thinking, why did I create these people? And Yahweh said, I will destroy man whom I created <clears throat> from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I made them. Now, I want to just mention something about this. You're probably wondering, well, why would God create, or should I say destroy, the, the animals on the earth? Because they were mixed in a society of evil. Now, if men were, and his thoughts of his heart was evil continually, you have to believe that there was a bestiality going on with animals. You would have to believe that, because people do that nowadays. And if people do that nowadays, if the evil is in their heart, so in my opinion, maybe the animals were destroyed um, because they were no longer pure. They were no longer clean animals. That's just my opinion again. Or they were associated with them or something. But when God cleans a land, when He purifies anything, He destroys, He cleans it. He destroys it. There's not a trace of it left behind. All right. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. These are the generations of Noah. <clears throat> this is interesting because it's a very short list. 
Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with Elohim. That's such a nice thing when you hear that. Noah walked with Elohim. That means Noah was a pleasant sight in God's eyes. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth also was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. Doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible that before Jesus comes, it would be like the days of Noah? Look what's going on. There is more rumors of wars going on right now on this earth than I've ever, ever seen. Even worse than World War II. Almost every country is thinking about hitting another. Pakistan and Iran are having a, an issue. You've got Syria and Turkey having an issue. Israel and the Arab world are the... Um, Islamic world are in an argument. Then you've got China and oh, the U.S. and oh my goodness, it's just crazy. We don't have a lot of time left, people. If you haven't gotten your life right with the Lord, repent, man, because the time is short. All right. It's verse 13. And Elohim said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with, or destroy them with the earth. So he's telling Noah, I've had enough. These people, their days are numbered. Now he goes into this, which I find fascinating because he's now giving Noah instructions to do something that you can tell Noah really trusted God because nobody in their right mind would have done this who didn't trust God. He's asked to build a massive boat on dry land, no ocean anywhere nearby. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark. So, first of all, you're going to make a boat, an ark out of gopher wood, which is a solid wood. Uh, it's even a waterproof, somewhat waterproof um, uh, wood. And it's going to have rooms in it. Obviously, that's going to accommodate all the different animals. And shall, shall pitch within and without with pitch. So now he's saying, go for wood and I want you to, I want you to um, waterproof it with pitch. So he's got to paint this whole thing. And this is a big boat. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make, of, make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits so first of all, 300 cubits is 450 feet, okay? A football field is roughly 360 feet. So imagine add another 100 feet onto a football field. That is the length of this arc. So 300 cubits and the breadth of it, which is the width, is 50 cubits. And 50 cubits is 75 feet wide. So that doesn't seem very wide, but... That's wide enough, 75 feet. And the height of it, 30 cubits. And 30 cubits is 45 feet. So if you want to know how high 45 feet is roughly, it's basically three-story uh, home. So you've got it. Uh, this thing is 45 feet in height, 75 feet in width, and 450 feet in length doesn't seem like it's very big on the and the width and the height but the length of it, it it's God wanted it made this way specifically probably so it could handle it, it was it was low enough where uh, maybe it's just I mean God did everything perfectly he knew what he was doing I'm not even going to question the, the, the dimensions of the ark because he knew exactly what would have been the best ark to have with the weight of those animals in there not too high you know, where was not going to do this or whatever. So, God's amazing. All right, verse 15. Oh, we already did 15. So, and 16. He even gives them, he even tells them about a window he wants in there. And the window shalt thou make to the ark in a cubit. So, not a huge window, big enough to open up and probably to get rid of. Just, it said one window, didn't say many. That window was probably to get rid of a lot of the... Uh, Maybe the lot of the dung, you know, the waste that was in the ark. Just stick it out the window. And it, to, and it is to go above the door of the ark. Thou shalt set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories. Thou shalt make it. So here is Yahweh, or Elohim, telling Noah, 
It's going to be 45 feet in height and it's going to be three stories high with rooms. So again, three stories high and multiple rooms for 450 feet wide is, or, or long, uh, 75 feet wide and 45 feet in height. So it's a reasonably sized, that's a pretty good sized boat. <laughs> uh, it's a zoo on, on, on the water. And verse 17 says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the bread of life. From under the heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. And some might say, well, this is awfully drastic. But just like I mentioned before, when God purifies something, he doesn't mess around. When he chooses to destroy evil, he doesn't mess around. Verse 18, but with thee will I establish my covenant. So Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark. To keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after this kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for three for thee, sorry, and for them. So collect enough food for yourselves and the animals. Uh, this is going to be a while. Thus did Noah according to all that Elohim commanded him, did he. All right. We're going to move on to verse 7. We're going to read up to 20, and that'll conclude part 1. And Yahweh said unto Noah, verse 1, chapter 7, Come thou and all of thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, I wanted to make another point here. Here's Noah building this ark. Who knows how long it took him to build this? He probably had the help of his sons, but it probably took him a long time. Noah was... He was older. He was like, I don't know, 500 and something years old at that time or something. Probably took him a good 7,500 years to build a, a, a boat of that size. And during that time, there's no doubt that he would have been proclaiming what was coming. And he was probably mocked and he was laughed at and his family was shunned. So it was probably a very, very lonely life. The only one in, in God's eyes that was righteous was Noah and his family. Well, Noah and his association, which was his family. Everyone else probably mocked him, laughed, and look at this fool, he's building a gigantic boat on dry land. Like, what's he thinking? It had never rained on the earth at that time. It just never did. The top of the earth had a canopy of water. It was never released. The way that it would, um, the vegetation um, would get its moisture would be from dew. And of course, the lakes and the rivers, but it had never rained. So people were like, why are you building a boat? And Noah probably said, you know, there's, there's going to be a great flood that's coming. And they probably just ridiculed him and laughed at him. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, so before Noah's Ark, it never rained. It just, there was just dew, moisture. It's like a big canopy. This is why people lived longer back then. After the Ark, after the flood, you'll notice that people didn't live very long after that. Maybe like 120 years or something, as it says in at the beginning here. But before that, a man would live 900 years. Look at Adam. Because being inside of that solarium, you didn't have the ultraviolet rays or the radiation from the sun. Uh, it, you were just the 
best word I could say. He just lived longer. <laughs> All right. Okay, where are we? Okay, so let's start at verse 7, or chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. And Yahweh said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. So, what does God want? He wants seven perfect animals. I'm not sure what they were, but they had to be pure. Without blemish, probably. And this was going to be used for the sacrifice later that would be offered to God. And of course, God knew this was going to happen. <laughs> and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So, we need seven clean animals, and they're going to be used for sacrifices. But the two by two are the ones that are going to repopulate the earth. And also, there will be maybe other animals that they will use for, for, for eating. Verse 3 of chapter 7, Of fowls also of the air by seven, so seven birds that are clean, that are without blemish, kosher maybe, if you want to say that, male and the female, and to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that Yahweh commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. So I'm guessing he was around five hundred when he started building this boat. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as Elohim had commanded Noah. Can you imagine? Here is the Lord calling these animals to come to the ark, two by two. You think the people on the earth at that time would have looked at this and said, you know what, maybe we should reinvestigate this. How on earth are they calling two animals by two? It's just amazing. It blows my mind that they didn't wake up. But the evil was such in their hearts, they were totally deceived. They had no discernment whatsoever, no wisdom, nothing. They, were not be, they, they weren't able to, to, to make out right from wrong. It says evil was in their hearts continually. So they probably just looked at this and said, Oh, what a spectacle this is. It's never going to fill up the entire earth. And it came to pass, after seven days, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened the windows of heaven were opened that means the canopy on the top was opened and now here comes the rain and you can imagine the people on the earth are like what is this because they never experienced rain before and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights in the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. So here you have two of every animal. And of course there will be other animals down the road that would come from other breeds, etc. But basically, and I would have to say too, I would have to argue that there is probably dinosaurs, smaller ones, baby ones, that were on the ark. Because like, I do believe that there was dinosaurs back then. Obviously they found the bones, so I wouldn't be too surprised if they were also on the ark. And they weren't giant ones, they were smaller ones. You'd never get them on the boat. 
And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breadth of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as Elohim had commanded him, and Yahweh shut him in. Yahweh shut the door. Noah didn't even shut that door. That was a big door. <laughs> Elohim, Yahweh, closed the door and sealed them in. And if you think about it, you have to admit that I'm sure some of them must have been a little bit nervous, okay? Uh, we're going in a boat and it's going to flood the entire earth. But I'm sure they had faith, but I don't know, I would have been still a little nervous. Um, I, I, I don't have a huge fear of water, but um, I did when I was younger, and I would have been a little bit nervous. But then again, after seeing all those animals come two by two into the ark, well, I probably wouldn't have had any fear after that. That would have been amazing to see. 17, verse 17, chapter 7, verse 17, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up, above the earth. All of a sudden they're in there, all of a sudden they just feel the ark doing this. And they're like, whoa! You know, this is a new experience for them too. Think about it. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went up, went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. So even the highest peak mountains, it's that the water was still another 22 feet or so above that. Just to make sure nobody wanted to build a tower <laughs> on the toppest mount, to, on, the, on the toppest hill, or the toppest, let's use the right grammar, on the top of the hill, the mountain. 22 feet. And this is where we ended, friends. Um, just hope you're enjoying this. This is an absolutely amazing story. It is true. Those of you that don't believe that it's true, it is absolutely 100% true. So, friends, when we return on the next Bible break, part two of Noah's Ark, please join me, won't you? God bless you all. <laughs>